All right, well, if everyone's ready, I think I will get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Notations, Doing Democracy Through Creative Writing. My name is Stacey Brennan, and I'm the Curator of Education for the Lehigh University Art Galleries. This event tonight is brought to you through a partnership with the Notation Series presented by the Creative Writing Department at Lehigh University, as well as in partnership with the Lehigh University Libraries and the Lehigh University Art Galleries. I'd like to thank Stephanie Watts, author and associate professor of English at Lehigh and Jasmine Woodson, associate assistant director of instruction and outreach at the libraries for partnering with us to bring this program to you today, as well as Bob Watts for coordinating with the students who will be reading with us this evening. Rashawn Allen, Destiny Bonilla, Izzy Brennan and Paige, Brennan, Paige Hagan, excuse me. Um, so just a few logistics that I'd like to go over before we begin. Um, please be aware that we are recording this presentation and we'll include it in the videos section of our website at luag.org. We ask that you keep your audio muted during the presentation and use the chat box for any questions for the presenters. At about 7.45, we will begin our interactive writing prompt and we'll encourage you to raise your hand or unmute yourself, um, or you can use the chat box to participate however you feel most comfortable. Um, if you are not familiar with the Lehigh University Art Galleries, um, we are a museum located on campus that has nearly 17,000 works of art in our collection from diverse time periods and cultures around the world. We have seven gallery spaces, as I mentioned, 52 outdoor sculptures, um, and you can view exhibition, our exhibitions and little over 2,300 works of art on our website um, through artstore.com. Um, we hope that you'll explore those resources and we'll come to visit our galleries, um, which are available by appointment currently, as well as our outdoor exhibition on the Greenway and outdoor sculptures. Um, this presentation tonight is offered in conjunction with an exhibition, Doing Democracy, from the Monopolis Collection. The exhibition, as described in the title, is really about the continued conversation around democracy and the ongoing practice of active participation and engagement in a democratic process. Um, the art, art galleries are really dedicated to serving the community as a space to explore and learn about diverse perspectives. Last spring, we worked with students and faculty from the departments of history, political science, communication, journalism, art architecture, and design to co-curate the exhibition um, this exhibition offered an opportunity for students to identify themes and topics that resonated with them from a selection of 500 photographs that were donated to the university, um, at 500 out of 2,000 that were donated to the university from George Stephanopoulos. From the 500, we selected 107, which can be arranged, you can see in the galleries here, this is a mock-up. Um, they're arranged into clusters or groupings of photos to tell the story of democracy in the United States and to shine a light through a photographer's lens on specific events um, from the 20th century to the present. The photos um, are also featured in the gallery as well as uh, an outdoor exhibition on the South Bethlehem Greenway, um, which we hope you will take a walk and enjoy before the weather gets too cold. Um, but the photos that are featured in the exhibition really um, are images from the civil rights movement, leaders and individuals, um, who provide sources of strength and leadership, um, everyday Americans, politicians, and the media. Our hope is that this exhibition will provide a platform for participants from all political perspectives and backgrounds to share their ideas and opinions, learning from the past and planning for the future. The exhibition will be on view through May by appointment in the main galleries located within Zoner Art Center where you can have a once in a lifetime opportunity to have the museum to yourself right now, um, as well as through the summer on the South Bethlehem Greenway. As I mentioned previously, you can view all of the photos in the exhibition on our website, as well as wonderful resources by students, written labels, um, excerpts, videos, and interactive activities at luag.org. I would now like to pass the microphone over to Professor Bob Watts from the English department, who will introduce our readers this evening. Um, similar to how photographers use a camera as a tool for social justice and bringing awareness to issues that affect us, um, writers have the same opportunity to use th these tools um, to bring about awareness. And we're grateful to the readers this evening who will have selected works that really resonate with the theme of democracy. So 
thank you, Bob. I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our speakers. All right. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Bob Watts. I'm a uh, professor in the English department in the creative writing program. And thank you very much, Stacy, for putting this event together. I'm very excited to be a part of it, uh, both because of the, the necessary engagement we all need to make with de democracy and increasing social justice, but also because it gives us a chance to highlight some of the really outstanding work being done by the students in the creative writing program here. We'll be having a reading by four of those students tonight, and I'm going to introduce them all at the same time and then as each one reads, when one finishes, the next one will just begin. So um, first we'll have Rashawn Allen, class of 22, who will be reading uh, fiction, an excerpt from his novel. Then we'll have Destiny Bonilla, a uh, poet, uh, class of 22, who will be reading a couple of her poems. Izzy Brennan, also a poet, reading a, a class of 21, reading a couple of her poems. And then Paige Pagan, class of 2019, and currently an MA student in the Department of English, uh, reading poems as well. So, uh, Rashawn, if you're ready, we'd love to hear you read. Okay. Um, so I'll be reading a short excerpt from my novel. And so in this scene, the two main characters are coming head to head in this final battle of the state championship. Down. Miles judders his head to fight off the forthcoming collapse. It wouldn't happen, not here, not at this very moment when the boy was so close to obtaining it all. No, he shouts with an audible force that turns the cacophonous scene to a serene silence. The boy fires out his stance with the last drop of vigor left. He barrels forward, but meets a solid wall. He then plants his back leg into the ground and surges forward. Even if it had been every soul in the stadium, there is no way to oppose. The boy comes crashing through and tumbles right into the end zone. The crowd erupts from all sides, and Miles stands raising his hands up as tears stream from his eyes. BB. My team begins to hurl their helmets to the ground. It was over as we look at the handful of seconds left on the clock. Heads and dreary eyes all lower in dis despair. To try so hard, but to end with nothing is only fitting in with my life story. I sink to the bench right next to Sam. His face is broken, yet I do not feel the same. Maybe I've become so used to it, it no longer hurts. I start to take in the scene once again, the bright lights, the fans. I will never see again in my lifetime. In a way, I am grateful just being here. A smile widens across my face. I belong, I whisper quietly. In a deep breath, I move to my shaky feet, impossibility directly in front of me. Like a tsunami, it towers over. There is no other way, so here, I choose to live out the rest of my days in the agony of defeat, but I will not go quietly. To not try is to never have lived at all, and I can never play it safe. Phoebe, Sam says, do you have always had that shit, I say. I'm the greatest, and don't you ever forget it. I float onto the field. Through my ease, I turn the stadium's roar into silence. Their shouts and cheers are muted as the gleaming lights grow brighter. I am in the spotlight, but not a tremble of doubt passes over me. I stand here in this moment, joyful for possibly the first time since playing this game. I lower into my stance for the final play. Ocean, ocean, I take in another breath. The ground quakes as the crowd rise to their feet. Set, I exhale out. My body is loose and now free. Hit, I patiently move out the backfield as I had watched long before. The quarterback drops back and searches downfield. I pass through the line of scrimmage as the QB still looks. I am an afterthought, the last possible option if everything goes wrong. But even then, it may be a better bet to just run for it. The boy looks left and right. He finds no one. The D-line breaks through, and he is forced to scramble outside. His face is panicking. He is running for dear life, trying to keep the play alive. Everyone he sees is covered until he locks eyes with me. I gulp deeply. I don't even notice my subtle head shake. Before he is tackled to the ground, he throws the ball out. With a slight flinch, my hands clasp over the ball. Run, BB, run, the chick shout pierces through my puzzled thoughts. Immediately, I take off, sprinting for my life as I stiff arm the lunging defender and zoom down the sideline. Still a full field to go. The defenders swarm in from all directions. I begin zigzagging between the hash marks. I high step out of an arm tackle, but nearly trip and end it all. I continue to north it panning as I cross midfield. 
I spin and smoothly cut my way past the remaining few, now free with the end just within reach and not a single foe in my way. But in a shadowy flash, 20 appears out in front. It is like he had come out of thin air or maybe he'd always been there, inevitably blocking my path. I can no longer see the pylons behind him. He left no room for me to go around. I couldn't wait. The stampede is right on my ass. I charge forward, bellowing out my lungs. He mirrors me and does the same. As I approach, the stadium warps. The lights are gone. The stands are empty. There is only him, the Merc, and me. It flashes to the city, torn in fires for the first couple of sets. The next, I am young in the early days of the game. He too shapes with me, though much differently. Miles. Miles sees himself running down the street with Lamar, only he isn't there, and he is alone, rushing toward the collision. The fatigue has wrung his anger dry. The boy is driven by something else, entirely unique. It is what he wants, completely separated from the burdens that surround him. He rushes forward with everything left. Thank you. Okay, up next is Destiny. Sorry, technical difficulty, one moment. Go ahead, Destiny, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, sorry, I thought that was like on me. Um, <laughs> Oh, sorry about that. No, it's totally fine. Um, so this is a poem titled, If God Was a Woman. If God was a woman, she'd love Mother Nature so sweetly, spring would last an eternity. The trees swaying their branches to the tempo of their wedding song, hummingbirds orchestrating a ballad for the ballroom made of marigolds. She'd tuck sunsets into Mother Nature's pockets, vows beyond words, love notes written into the ink of the clouds. Over a moonlit dinner with their plates of sweet mulberry sky, wine glasses of deep ocean cabernet, mother nature would confess she hated the color gray and God, sweet as can be, would dismiss the dreary shades of life if only to momentarily please a wife. She wouldn't let their daughters be fooled by vanity, artificial wide eyes from lacing their own wine with belladonna to attract the men distracted by the folly of glory and pride. She wouldn't watch from her garden as her children tore themselves apart. She couldn't make us pick to live or to feel alive because she loves her children too much. An aching love, a tear spilled for their mistakes love. Her forgiveness would be rosy pink like the flush skin of her sinners. She tell us the sin of skin is forgetting to indulge. Um, and then the next one is titled Song of Strength. Lend me your backbones, dear sisters, aunts, and grandmothers of past lives, whose shackles are broken, backbones stronger than steel, forged by conflict, toughened by the strikes of our fathers. Oh, women who learn to sing behind zipped lips, remind me of endurance. Lashes to the face for sweet voices, daring to fill the air that didn't belong to them, became the unfortunate beat to our history's anthem. Lend me your backbones, the very ones that held your soft, fierce human bodies in the face of the devil, that bore your stresses and pains like goddesses proud and unbending. My own seems twisted, wicked and warped by tongues too sharp, tongues with spells that cut my nerves in pieces, loose ends frayed and sparking in erotic misfires, firing blows to my ego. Sisters, forgive me for my weakness. Forgive me for sinning and bending to bugs that bite. I've forgotten how to stand straight like a goddess, to raise my sword like a warrior, to heal like a priestess. I have forgotten how to be a woman, but I have not forgotten how to sing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashawn and Destiny. Um, next we have Izzy Brennan. Um, let me just Hi. Okay, I have two poems for everybody. Um, 
The first one is called At the Corner of Church Street, 1940 for B.B. King. The leech of summer's heat latches its body across the back of his neck, reminding him it's July in Mississippi. His hands sway along the neck of his guitar, whose tune expands its arms from the corner of the street and hugs his hungry and tired city, carrying its way down the block, passing the man whose thin skinned hands suddenly pause before lighting the tip of his cigar, because despite his late wife's complaint that he can't hear, today he can and reaches the edge of town where two young children fleeing from their mothers, from their mother whose groceries slip and slide within her sweaty arms grip, stop and turn towards the music. His tune will soon with its soul that sings and cries and aches like his bare feet that carry him across the dirt and cement every day, will pass through quiet rural roads and into cities that are drowned by the aggravated hum of a Ford Mustang. Um, okay, and then the last poem I have is called Abuelo. Hourglass figures sway from kitchen to dance floor and back to kitchen as the men, their shoulders hugged by cashmere, sit alongside him speaking of medicine. Their hands kissed by age hold avo cigars. Through the stairwell rails, my eyes look down upon faint smoke rising from their conversation, ghosts dancing a slow merengue. His subtle expressions remind everyone that although age can dull and weather, his mind still cut sharp, highly attentive to the wines of grandchildren, wine glass clinks of my aunts, all while he wins another round of dominoes. He sits still, except for his eyes wandering in waves like the sea pierced by sunlight, drifting from the sun-kissed, sun-bit Caribbean to the white walls of this Midwestern basement. Thank you. Wonderful job, thank you. And Paige. Hi, thank you. Um, I'll be reciting a single spoken word. To all you've done. My mother and I would walk a mile from the bus stop to where he was, the long gray buildings where the fog ended. I only saw him through squinted eyes. The blur of the old scratched windows skewed my vision. I stood on the outside and him on the inside, separated by the sedentary window, with one hand holding the cold telephone to my inattentive ear and the other pressed against the division between us. I prepared for our routine goodbye. His hand would meet rise, his hand would rise to meet mine where they should have touched. He always ended the visit with an I love you. I would hang up the phone, drop my hand, turn and walk away, whispering I love you to the solemn air that could not reach his ears. Love from a daughter he cannot hear. I learned to fill the hole he left within me, perfecting my facade of normalcy by excelling in my studies. I was obsessed with being number one because that was all I remember you telling me. You're destined for greatness. Do all the things I couldn't do. You are my life, my love, my soul, my number one. I would do anything for you. But he couldn't do everything for me when his permanent residency was behind a set of bars instead of the rat infested one bedroom apartment with a lonely twin size bed where mom and I survived. Once he was my happiness. But almost too soon, he became darkness too. When he got out and re-entered my life as a preteen, I felt like I didn't need him then. I was forced to mature beyond my years and I attributed you as the one who helped me put up these guards of steel. And then you had the nerve to call me cold. But no amount of jail time could skew his Bronx tail because he never changed. He would come home late belligerent and antagonistic, slurring his words out of his whiskey drenched mouth that not even see Howard's violets could mask. And other times, he just wouldn't come home. I would take the sixth train to Hunt's Point to look for you. He'd be in the same spot every time. His eyes were closed and mouth wide open, nodding, leaning over bit by bit until he was inches from smacking his face on the pavement. But he wouldn't fall. I would feel the blood rush to my cheeks. My heart would accelerate. I would look around to make sure no one I knew was there and when the coast was clear, 
I would run up to him and grab his bruised arm from scab spots where his skin popped and I'd yell, you disgust me, you embarrass me, you shame me. His response, I'm sorry, I love you. How could you love me? I come second to the drink and the substance. He made it clear who's his number one. I'm not a kid anymore. Don't you dare fucking lie to me. He would tell me to watch my mouth. I would retort, oh, now you wanna be a father. And I knew my words cut him deep. My tongue murdered his soul and I relished in it. When his tears would fall, I would turn away because he deserved it. I tried to hurt you just as much as you hurt me. But even with my slanderous words and cutthroat ways, his love for me never wavered, it always remained. It was his genuine heart that would push him to go to rehab, but his weak mentality that would force him to relapse. Being clean for a year proved too big a feat and then the transplant rejection came. Helpless after none of my family members were a match, I took the test and my heart dropped when I was his only match. I would give him part of my liver if it meant he'd stay a bit longer, but the steady ticking clock became the enemy and his fight to make up for our lost time was the exhausted competitor until I said, you can let go now, dad. You don't need to suffer anymore. I'm sorry I haven't told you enough that you are my life, my love, my soul, my number one. And when he did let go, he taught me a life lesson. Just because someone is an alcoholic and drug addict doesn't necessarily make them a bad person, just a weak and foolish one. And just because someone isn't doesn't necessarily make them good or better. Out of all the things he did wrong, he made me. And it was him that helped me develop my strong will and determination, my yearning to be better than the hand I was given, my ability to stand tall in the face of adversity, my fight against the forces trying to pin me down, my desire to be the one who made it out of the cycle of abuse at its worst and break the chains of this fucking family curse. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really powerful and beautiful. And we appreciate you sharing with us. Um, Bob, did you wanna take yeah, some- Yeah, I just, yes. I'd like to just take a, a second to thank Rashawn, Destiny, Izzy, and Paige for the beautiful work and for you know taking the risk on presenting it tonight. It's always a, a daunting task to, to make your first reading. I know for at least several of you it was, but it was it was lovely. And uh, thank you so very much. I like what her own. Yeah, thank you so much to our um, all four of you. It was really wonderful um, to hear different perspectives. And that is the amazing power of art to share with us perspectives and understanding. Um, I, we are now going to participate in an um, interactive activity. I'm just going to share my screen again. Just give me one moment. I'm going to turn the mic over to Jasmine, who is with us. Hey, everybody. And I also want to echo my utmost gratitude to our readers. Um, wow. Like I was thinking, damn. Uh, and you remind me how much power there is in the spoken word, because we don't we don't hear that enough. Um, so I hope that for those of you who are still here, you'll you'll take the momentum that our, our readers just gave us and bring it into this activity um, of kind of reading and thinking and writing and hopefully sharing too. Um, so in the spirit of doing democracy. Uh, we're going to look at a poem and then look at a photograph and then go through a writing prompt that is in conversation with both of those things. Um, so I, th I think democracy is an interesting word. And part of what I hope that we'll do in these exercises is kind of entangle and make more immediate 
what democracy and citizenship and civic engagement um, or civic identity, and maybe even what liberation and freedom means to all of us. So we just heard from our readers kind of this really beautiful different expressions um, of what lived experience looks like. Um, and ultimately I feel like, like what Stacey just said, when we talk about perspectives and understanding, that's what democracy is like really tied to. Um, so the first poem, uh, or the poem that we're gonna look at is by Joy Harjo, who is um, a poet, a playwright, an artist. She's also the poet laureate of the United States. I'm so happy to say that uh, about a week or two ago, she renewed her third term for that. She's a member of the Muscogee Nation as well. Um, and Stacy, can you click on the, the image because it'll go to a website and we can actually hear her read this poem. Um, there's a, can you hear it? Because there's a, um, the little play icon. I, I'm sorry, I had myself muted. So I oh, think okay. <laughs> An American sunrise. Okay. We were running out of breath. As we ran to meet ourselves, we were surfacing the edge of our ancestors fights and ready to strike. It was difficult to lose days in the Indian bar if you were straight. Easy if you played pool and drank to remember to forget. We made plans to be professional and did, and some of us could sing. So we drummed a firelit pathway up to those starry stars. Sin was invented by the Christians, as was the devil we sang. We were the heathens, but needed to be saved from them. Thin chance. We knew we were all related in this story, a little gin will clarify the dark and make us feel like dancing. We had something to do with the origins of blues and jazz. I argued with a Pueblo as I filled the jukebox with dimes in June, 40 years later, and we still want justice. We are still America. We know the rumors of our demise. We spit them out. They die soon. So let's just take a few minutes and what struck you about that poem? And that can be the imagery, that can be the words, the rhythm of the words, the sound of the words. And you can either um, put things in the chat or you can speak out loud if you feel more comfortable doing it. Any thoughts on the title in American Sunrise? Or even just the way she chooses kind of in terms of the, the language, how she structures the poems, so the repetition of we were, we were. I'm amazed by the way she incorporates um, Gwendolyn Brooks, pool players. We strike mm -hmm. straight, we mm -hmm. sing sin, we think. Mm -hmm. so it's just amazing that she's mm -hmm. able to build her own poem on that structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so like how she's we were, we were, then we are. So from the, the past into the present. And but also the idea of a sunrise, I think speaks to a future too. You know, it's funny I picked this poem out um, in October. 
but I feel like it's so, it feels right now, like it feels right right now. Um, Linda, were you raising your hand? Yes, I was just going to point out in terms of the structure also that repetition of we, 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 mm -hmm. which falls always at the end of the line. But in the last case, they die. That's very striking to me. Mm -hmm. This beautiful balance of strength and fragility in this that I think is really well written. Mm -hmm. Rashawn pointed out the contrast between um, the imagery of, of Christianity, so the devil and the heathens, which um, to me is, is speaks to the idea of like, um, like storytelling and what stories are given kind of dominance in our culture and which aren't and who was hurt by that and who's, who's not, you know, who, who does that give power to? <clears throat> I have a number of students in the audience tonight, and they would all tell you that one of the things I would love about this poem is the specificity of it. The uh, mm -hmm. the um, quarters in the jukebox, or the dimes in the jukebox, mm -hmm. the uh, the Indian bar playing pool. Mm -hmm. It's just um, it builds a world for us. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add to what Bob said that about that and about the um, connection with Brooks. You know, if you just take the last <clears throat> word of each line, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, mm. we, they die soon. <laughs> it, it's mm -hmm. just, it's really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, like that, it was wonderful to hear her say it. Like yeah, he, he says it. That yeah. yeah. John wrote here, almost every sense seemed to be invoked, feel the feeling of taste and sound. Um, he said he appreciates that, feels so alive. Mm -hmm. I did want to share um, that Joyce Harjo has, um, as a poet laureate, been working on a project um, called Living Nations, Living Words <clears throat> um, via the Library of Congress. And I, uh, what it is, is it includes a story map of Native American poets um, reading their work and uh, sometimes like giving explanations to their work too. So I highly encourage you to check that out. I just put the link in the chat. Um, but we can go ahead and move to the, the photograph um, that resonates, I think, with a lot of themes in this poem. So, uh, Stacey, do you want to give any yeah. intro to before the students? Okay. Absolutely. So um, this is a photograph by Arthur Rothstein, um, a girl at G's Bend, Alabama. It was taken around 1937. Um, during the Dust Bowl. And um, this is part of, it's included in the Doing Democracy exhibition. Um, and it is in the Everyday American section of the exhibition. And we were fortunate enough to have um, the students not only write labels for the exhibition, but also to narrate audio clips and videos. And we had a wonderful um, intern, Ray Ukan, who created videos which are available on our website, um, which give context and background to the photograph. So I'm gonna play uh, the video now that um, for this photograph. Hired by the Farm Security Association in 1935 to photograph the effects of the Dust Bowl, Arthur Rothstein focused much of his work in the Midwest and the Deep South. Rothstein was assigned to G's Bend, a 
cultural mecca in Alabama where women wove quilts as a means of artistic expression and as a form of resistance against poverty. The main subject in this photograph, Artelia Bendolf, worked with her family on a farm for white landowners. At a mere 10 years old, Bendolf grappled with the extreme poverty her family faced, especially as descendants of past enslaved people. The irony present in this photograph is familiar. The newspaper's depiction of a woman holding a dish of food shoves the wealth of upper-class Americans in Bendolf's face. Perpetuating false ideals of consumerism, this newspaper reinforces the degrading impacts of poverty and isolation. Most may experience a similar feeling of being trapped within your race, socioeconomic status, or by the high standards that the media portrays. This photograph presents the question of how one escapes the confines of poverty, or if that escape is even possible at all. So a wonderful um, writing by Caroline Wierza, uh, Mierzwa. Um, and, you know, Arthur Rothstein was an amazing photographer who had, you know, a five decade long career. And a lot of his work focused on um, rural America and also kind of just looking at everyday Americans and bringing to light kind of um, the lived experience in America. So I think this is a great photograph that resonates with our theme this evening. Oh. Now we're gonna go to our prompts. Yeah, so, so with that, like when I see the photo, I think of this really stark representation of like two different kind of Americas and one that's made hyper visible and one that's not. Um, and in the same way when the poem, there's, you know, we could, there's so much to say about Native American and Indigenous people's history that's just been completely erased, but that's so fundamental to what America is for good and for bad. Um, so in, in the spirit of the poem saying we and using this idea of we and the, the photo being about um, this kind of different versions of we and which is privileged and which is not, I'm asking you to think about who are we? If, if democracy is a representation of the people, who are we as a people? So what does we mean to you? Um, and describe your we's collective memory. So um, Joyce Harjo does that. She, like um, John was saying, like she really evokes a really rich sensory world of what that looks like for her. So what brought them joy? What brought them sadness? What did they dream of? And how does your we tell their stories? And maybe their stories are hidden or maybe they've been erased. Um, and you can write, if, you, if you're not sure where to start, you can write beginning with we were and then end with we are. Um, another thing you can think about is when you hear that term in American sunrise, what is that, what imagery does that bring to your mind? So we can spend, um, we'll say like 10 minutes just thinking about these, writing in response to these and writing in whatever form is most comfortable to you and most, um, kind of representative of, of your thoughts and feelings around these prompts. And then we will come back as a group. And if you feel comfortable sharing what you wrote about or what you wrote that uh, we'll have time for that. So we'll just take uh, nine or 10 minutes now.
So we're gonna give it another minute and then we'll all come back together. Okay, let's come back as a group. So would anybody be willing to share what they wrote or just, you know, what they've thought about um, over the course of looking at this poem or the photo um, and how that maybe that's impacted your ideas about democracy. Linda. I'm just gonna say what I thought. This is a difficult one. I, what I could not get out of my mind for my we, if you will, was mm -hmm. um, we were white. <laughs> we are guilty. I just mm -hmm. feel kind of trapped in this sort of we-ness, if you will, and, and more and more and more in these present days when Every other time I turn on the news, there's some new atrocity and I just think, oh God, what do we do to, to, to atone, to fix this, to apologize, to, to act? Do we have any right to act? Should we sit down and shut up? I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we should do, really. Mm. That's a cop out, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, it's not a cop out at all. I think, frankly, I think everybody feels that same. We have at some point probably felt that same powerlessness. But I also hope that we also feel a sense of um, togetherness and like move progression forward. As, as slow as it might be, it, it feels like there's movement. Well, the, this democracy pro, pro, project down in the galleries, I've been to a couple of times now, and it is it is so powerful and, and so indicting in a way, but at the same time, it's kind of healing. It feels purgative. I recommend it to everyone if you have not, and I know it's hard, <laughs> with COVID and probably Zollner is, is not as accessible right now as it has been. But at some point, everybody really should try to see it if you haven't, because it, it, it's astonishing. It's really, really beautiful and astonishing and, and, and powerful, moving. Yeah, I wrote down, um, Stacy had said, and she introduced the exhibition, learning from the past and planning for the future. Like, um, and that's what, you know, when I've seen the images, that's what it makes me think of, learning from the past and I'm thinking about that sun, you know, that American sunrise. Yes, and there's so many lessons to learn from, I think, from viewing these um, photos because they tell individual, but also kind of community and our experience. Um, so it's, it, thank you, Linda. I'll, I'll send you your check later for that promotion of the galleries, but just, um, no, I, I definitely appreciate that. And I think um, it re this, the, the pairing of writing and thinking of spoken word and how that meets these images, both past and present and what the future looks like is really powerful. And it gives us tools for um, really talking about these issues and making change, which is the step in the right direction. Yes, and I should add that one of the most powerful things about, about the display was the student labels. 
I was so impressed. I, I <coughs> really just was very proud to be at Lehigh and to have students who are so thoughtful and bright and brilliant. So thank you. <laughs> and all of that can be found on our website too. If others are looking or worried about um, coming in person, you can view that on the website. So do we have others who would want to share their writing or their thoughts from these prompts? Feel free to use the chat box as well. I am no writer, but I strive to be. Um, and I'll share, you know, just some of my thoughts. I was thinking of um, my grandparents who immigrated to America and escaped very narrowly the Holocaust. Um, and that as a we of kind of like just my family history. Um, and, you know, I thought about um, how we, are how you know how what I have become what my family has become the beneficiaries um, the living legacies sustaining the dream and upholding their memories and clinging to the belief and seeing what's possible um, so those were just some of my thoughts thinking of kind of the collective we in terms of just my own individual experience thank you Stacy I see, um, Rashawn, you put something in the chat. If, would you be at all interested in reading it? And if you don't, what, you can just Hello. say no. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, you're, we can okay. hear you. Can yeah, hear you. I can read it. Um, it's sort of like, just like evoking some like childhood memories and then looking to where we are now that kind of like, got me in the sense of like we were and then we are. Um, we are dreamers. We used to think beyond the stars. Our passion and joys ran so vividly in our hearts, but now that is all gone. The darkness of reality besieged the sacred place, confining our ambitions to the limits set from those above. Men in suits cover over the skies, blotting out every notion of something greater beyond. We are the hollow remnants of our former selves. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I, um, I'm John. I'll share something that I wrote. Um, I, I've been thinking a, a lot, like when I hear it, actually, um, I feel like we sometimes feel, and again, I mean this, I, I, I'm going to share this with deep respect to the undergrad students who are here. Um, for those of you who haven't met, I'm a fairly new professor here at Lehigh, but we sometimes feels like a warning sign as a teacher, uh, because who uses it or who winds up feeling possessed uh, of the ability to use it, and that it oftentimes winds up, at least in the papers that I grade in my like you know my, my race and media seminars and things like that, um, that it's the province of you know white students in particular who feel that they've been taught that their individualized experience is one that can be universalized. We as Americans is how it oftentimes gets used, that that kind of non-hyphenate claim to Americanness is a we that people will understand. But in reality, and I think that one of the things that you know jumped out to me in the, in the, in the poem at the beginning of this was that Harjo's people were seeing American sunrises for centuries before the we who I'm used to, you know, who I'm used to hearing talking about it in those types of ways. And so this semester, today was, today's my, today was my last day of teaching during what has been the most challenging semester of my personal career. And um, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, black feminist writing uh, around what, what they term a, a heterogeneous collectivity, that black women have that, or you know, that uh, women of color feminism evokes that. Difference in sameness, sameness in difference. And I think this semester for me was very much about trying to build a different kind of we uh, a space of acknowledgement, intimacy, and care during four months of trials and pain and uncertainty. And I'm just very grateful that I think that the we that 
people were invested in building during these times was a we of care, a we of solidarity and a, and a we of acknowledgement. And I'm just feeling very, very grateful, you know, to, to this space as well for asking these types of questions as a kind of exclamation point on the work that I felt like was the most important thing to do this semester. That's, I don't know, that's, that's just what it kind of evoked for me. I, I, I'm not, I, uh, that, that's the way that I write creatively, I guess. Thanks, much appreciated. Thank you. I, let, I wrote down that um, term heterogeneous collectivity. That's, so that's when like, you know, it's it's a $10 word, but it's so apt <laughs> it's for, a, just, it's for describing that. Yeah. Um, would anybody else like to talk about their thoughts about just going through this um, or what they they wrote? Okay, well, out of respect for everyone's time, it is 8.01. Um, so we can, I guess we can go to wrap up. Yeah, um, well, this was a really wonderful evening. I'm grateful to our readers this, e this evening. Um, thank you to Professor Watts, um, Bob and Stephanie, and to Jasmine um, for leading us through these prompts and really left so much for all of us to think about. Um, we have upcoming notations events on February 11th. Please save the date is our next um, notations event. Um, there are a series of three in the spring, so we hope you'll join us for additional um, programs. We have tomorrow uh, LUAG at Lunch, which are student-led series around works of art from the Lehigh University Art Gallery collection. So we hope you'll join us for short lectures, short presentations, or about a half hour, um, really great discussions. Um, and I hope that you'll follow all of us on social media and participate. Um, our handles are below. But thank you all so much for joining us this evening, um, for sharing your writing with us, um, and for participating in democracy. It's really been wonderful. So thank you all. Yes, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Jasmine. Wonderful prompts. Amazing. <laughs>